I saw, I saw that movie uh, Den of Thieves yesterday. It's not, not bad. It's okay. a, there's some, you know, some guy that trying to break into some... Uh, so, yeah, some crazy bank nobody's ever broken oh, into. Yeah. And it's got... Uh, what's the guy's name? You know, one of these action hero heist mm-hmm. movies. It was better than I expected. It had an interesting twist. Okay. Is it in theaters? Or yeah, in theaters. Okay. Yeah, I have this thing called Movie Pass. Have you heard of Movie Pass? No, oh, my gosh. You, oh my gosh! You pay like a certain amount, like a fee per year, and then like you get movie pass cost me eight bucks a month. Okay, and you can see one movie per day in the theater. Holy Are you serious? And I'm a completionist. I see every movie. I saw My Little Pony. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, experience. I like it. What theater does this work for? A- any theater. So you check in on the app. So you have to be within a hundred yards of the theater. So you check in on the app. And you say, I'm going to see this movie. And then what it does is it loads money onto this debit card. And then you go in, and you, it's a visa. You go in and you buy the your ticket just like normal with this debit card. Okay. And I have two of them, one for me and one for my wife. So I bring friends and stuff all the time. It's pretty sweet. Oh, it's like, it's, if you see a lot of movies, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've spent, so I think I've had it for about four months now or something like that. So I guess if you, you know, figure it's $16 a month, you know. I, they have spent hundreds of dollars on my movies. I've probably seen 80 movies. I am not exaggerating. <laughs> I just go, I see every single movie that comes out. And, I, and I've got to the point now where I've gotten like desensitized to the movie. Like when you go to the movies, you know how like you try to stay awake, right? right. Well, you go to North Shore here, they have like nice reclining chairs. I mean, I have slept through like... <laughs> it took me four tries to see that um, uh, Blade Runner... 2049 movie and the first time I kind of perceived that oh I only I slept for like 10 minutes something like that the second time I saw it there were entire characters that were introduced and killed off (laughs) it was the first time I had seen them (laughs) that second time through the movie took me four shots it was at this one movie I don't remember which movie oh Coco the movie some kind of cartoon thing I fell asleep in that and it was like me and like three other people in the theater and apparently I was like snoring really loud <laughs> this old lady comes up and is like shaking me <laughs> wake, wake me up <laughs> oh yeah they are losing money on me but then again I have a couple of friends some former grad students that uh, have it that are not getting their money's worth you know they they're paying per month and they see they see either zero or one movie per month, so they're either barely breaking even or it's just a waste of money. I don't even understand it. And, and I mean, realistically, it probably has something to do with schedule. You know, as a professor, I have a very flexible schedule outside of when I have to be in front of a class, mm-hmm. so I can go to plenty of movies. And then we have these big long breaks and stuff. But if you work, you know, nine to five every single day, then you have less of a break and stuff. I don't know. Well, plus, at the, at the end of the day, they end up paying me. Because since I go to almost all the movies at Marcus Theaters, I use my loyalty card. So even though I spent 8 bucks, I, I'm still giving the theater 10 bucks. That's $10 in loyalty points on my card. Every 100 bucks, I get 5 bucks. I'm probably making 3 or $4 a month. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> when it all balances out. You get free popcorn, free sodas. See, the the real deficit here is my wife. Because when my wife goes to the movies, which is like maybe once one once a month tops, she I have to buy her those cookie dough bite things. It's like five dollars for candy. Come on. That's where all my loyalty points are going. Good thing got it. This is garbage. <laughs> Alright, what class is this? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred. All right. So let's. <laughs> all right, you guys are just getting a taste. <laughs> uh, all right, so last time we talked about how do human beings solve problems. We use memory, asking questions, and repetition. Um, and then we mentioned that human beings are so good at solving problems that we actually have trouble articulating how we solve them. And that's why learning to be a programmer is hard. Okay, it's that step, breaking things down into those tiny parts and getting our, getting our mind to slow down. So we kind of talked about what's the job of a programming language. So, you know, this is a, a tool for giving computers instructions. It also acts as a, let's just call middleman, between a human and a computer. 
All right, so last time we were talking about natural languages a little bit, where our target is another human. So whether you're speaking English or Spanish or Chinese, whatever it is, it's a human speaking to another human. And the thing is, is that we have a lot of practice with that, right? Mm -hmm. We deal with other people all the time, so that doesn't take practice. Well, now all of a sudden, we're talking to an alien, all right? And a really, really dumb one at that. As complex as you think computers might be, they, they basically can't do anything. We have to, like, sugarcoat every little tiny thing we wanted to do. And we're not good at slowing our minds down, breaking problems down to those little tiny baby steps in order to do this. Um, this is probably, I'm going to guess I'm going to get a no with this. How many of you have ever seen the movie What About Bob? All right. Two and a quarter people. Um, how many of you have heard of Bill Murray? Okay, one of the Ghostbuster guys, right? Okay, so years ago, Bill Murray was in a movie called What About Bob? And good movie, funny movie. I encourage you to check it out. Um, but, and this does relate to class, by the way. <laughs> um, in that movie, he, this guy had all sorts of social anxiety and stuff like that. He went and saw a, a psychiatrist guy who, um, you know, the guy was trying to sell his book and stuff. He had this book called Baby Steps. Where, you know, how could Bill Murray get through life every single day? Because he was afraid of everything. And it's like, take baby steps, you know. You know, how do you get into the elevator and push the button when he's, like, terrified of germs and all this stuff? Little tiny baby steps. And, and the movie's funny, so you should go and see it at some point. But that's really the philosophy we have to take as a programmer. Okay, we have to completely throw out the window everything we're really good at. Okay, that is dealing with other humans and our everyday type of problems where we take for granted how good we are at solving them. And slow things down and break all the solutions to our problems into little tiny baby steps. Now, the good thing for us, well... The bad thing for us is we're still going to suck at it. That's how good of problem solvers we are. The good thing for us is that up until this point, at least, things are, you know, every year, let's say, the problems we try to solve with computers get more and more and more complex. You know, we're still at a point now where the problems we even, we even try to solve with computers are pretty trivial. You know, like, you know, NBA Live, right? That was the game, right? Or NBA 2K. 2K, yeah. So, uh, you know, that game, even though to us it seems like a complex video game with lots of moving parts and stuff like that, that's trivial compared to walking, right? So that's as high as we've kind of gone, is a game like that. And even though we perceive that might be very difficult, I promise you it's nowhere near as difficult as things could be. We're starting to see things on uh, uh, TV about artificial intelligence and robots and, and stuff like that that are uh, going to take over the world, Terminator style, all over, uh, <laughs> things like that. Obviously, those are significantly more difficult problems. How many of you have heard of uh, machine learning? Okay, what is machine learning? It's a kind of current buzzword. What does that mean? Well, it means machines are learning. <laughs> but what's kind of the premise of machine learning? It's kind of an antithesis to programming. It's pretty interesting. <clears throat> so um, how many of you have heard of something called the neural network? Again, kind of a buzzwordy wordy thing, not necessarily sure what it is, possibly, but so effectively it's a computer program that tries to simulate the human brain. Now the issue there is, is that we know very little about the human brain relative to what we know about a lot of other things. So we're trying to simulate something we really don't understand. So take that for what it is. Now when I was in, um, uh, uh, in my undergrad, I had an artificial intelligence uh, class and we wrote a neural network and um, it was fascinating. So what we did is we forget about what, how the neural network is built, whatever, but you know, you kind of create this model of a brain and then you feed it information, you teach it, you train it. So what we were doing is we were training it on uh, the, the one through tens multiplication tables, you know, one times one, one times two, one times three, so on and so forth. And the way it works is we fed it the one through fives table. So, you kind of randomize the neural network at first, and you feed in the first thing. If it gets it wrong, you like slap it on the wrist, update it just a little bit. You're kind of like creating this little balance thing here until it gets all of the one through fives table correct. Okay, you just kind of balance. I mean, it's not doing real math, right? It's just guessing, and you've beat it up so much that it's just guessing right now out of fear. Okay, <laughs> you've balanced this thing. All right. What do you think happened when I fed it the six through tens table? information that he'd never seen before. It did all the time. Got it right about 99% of the time. Oh, really? So what you did is you trained it on the pattern of multiplication. I'm 
I only taught it one through five, but it learned six through ten because it learned the pattern of the underlying problem we were solving. Does that kind of make sense? So machine learning is kind of that type of thing where you have this tool in the middle and you can say, okay, well, here's something that we believe there's some sort of underlying pattern to. So even though we have kind of like these step-by-step -step instructions for doing multiplication, we kind of believe that inside of our head, you have all these, you know, electrical connections and stuff like that. And somehow it's just kind of figuring it out at some level. Maybe there's an underlying pattern to math or multiplication. So the evidence there was, there was. So if you can identify problems where, um, you know, let's take something else that a human being is very good at. Uh, let's say looking at uh, a person versus looking at a stuffed animal. How many of you think you'd be pretty good at identifying whether something is a, per a person or a stuffed animal? Most of us would be decent at that, right? I mean, that stuffed animal's gotta look really realistic before <laughs> we start having issues there. Okay, the computers aren't so good at that. That's why you see in the movies and stuff like that, people could fool uh, uh, facial recognition stuff by just wearing masks or you know, like you know, putting different, like putting you know, makeup on stuff like that. That just throws it off. So machine learning is, you know, you can train it to see a billion faces to the point where it can actually identify a face versus one person's face versus another person's face. Is this the same person as this guy over here wearing a disguise? That kind of stuff. Um, so the issue there is we've kind of decided, hey, there's some hard problems that we really have trouble solving as uh, computer programmers. And why is that? Because we have, a, we have trouble explaining how we do it. So all of you said that you'd be good at identifying the difference between a, a, a person and a stuffed animal. Like we feel like we could do that. We could, that's, in our, that's in our wheelhouse. Well, then I'd ask you how. And you kind of could guess, like, okay, well, I'm going to look for kind of furry stuff. Right, and if it doesn't have eyes that move, what if you had a stuffed animal that does that? Then you got that movie Ted, right? It's, it'll freak you out. Um, so, you know, in, in any case, we might have trouble articulating how we actually tell the difference between a human and a stuffed animal, but we all feel like we can do it. So, if we can't explain how we can do it, we can't write a piece of software to mimic that. You know what I'm saying? But what we could do is we could take a neural network. Potentially, if we, if we believe there might be an underlying pattern to the difference, we can take a neural network, feed it pictures of people and stuffed animals, let it guess, slap it on the wrist when it's wrong, and make little tiny tweaks until it, it's pretty good at determining the difference between a stuffed animal and a person. And in the end, you have no idea why it works, but it does work. Kind of makes sense? So that's kind of our current, that's, that's what machine learning is all about. It's trying to fill that gap of, well, we're too good at solving problems that we really can't explain how we do it, so let's just see if we can sh train this, uh, uh, this, this network over here to fake it, to do what we do even though we can't explain what we do. And that's when Terminator comes in, you got the cyborgs and explosions and, go ahead. That sounds really inefficient. Really inefficient, okay, in what way? Um, if we can't uh, explain how we're getting it to uh companies like the machines and solve these issues, then if we were able to uh, understand that, don't you think we'd be able to solve a lot more complex issues? Oh, absolutely. But how long would it take you to completely unambiguously describe to me how you tell the difference between a person and a stuffed animal? Way too long. Pro is it at least in the, uh, is it unreasonable to say you might never be able to do that unambiguously? Okay, I mean, we're so good at solving problems and there's, there's mysteries in between our own ears, right? We don't even know how this thing works, but we're good at things that we don't even understand. And it's kind of just through experience. Over the years, we've seen enough stuffed animals, we've seen enough people, we've gotten pretty good at differentiating the two. Okay, just like we can tell the difference between people and fruit. Okay, we might've learned that one first, right? You look at your pets like a cat. It takes a while for a cat no longer to be afraid of itself in the mirror. You notice that? Man, my cat used to beat itself up in the mirror all the time. It would scare the crap out of itself. It's the same. It's you. They don't know that. No. So, but, so you mentioned it's, it, it's uh, so on one hand, um, it might be inefficient, but it's an inefficiency compared to impossibility. And then on the other side, if we have these robots, let's say you're, let's say we're looking for a criminal. 
Okay, and we're you know we're you know, terrorist stuff. You know, somebody going through an airport or something like that. We want to find somebody who represents this one person. Well, we could put you know five thousand people at various airports, happen to looking at security footage and things like that, and they're they're nodding off, they're playing their cell phone games, whatever. Or we could have you know a zillion computers that do nothing but look at video feeds and try to identify faces. That's all they do. That's efficient. It's going to replace a lot of jobs. You know, what's going to happen? We have all these self-driving cars. You're no longer going to have bus drivers, no longer have cab drivers, no longer have Uber. You don't need a person in the Uber. If the, you just need a car. The car will take you there. Um, how many of you are familiar with the company Tesla? All right, so Tesla, you know, whether this ever becomes a reality or not, at the very least, it's an interesting idea. You know, they're trying to move towards consumer-based autonomous vehicles, the vehicles that not only drive themselves, but, you know, you know, stay in between the lines. They already have that with, like, this autopilot that you can go on the interstate. And um, Any of you ever driven a Tesla? So I test drove one uh, last year. Uh, I want to get a Model X. It's the only one I fit in. I, I seem petite, but in real life, I'm actually quite large. Um, but uh, so that's like their SUV one. And it has this autopilot, but I want the car that will just drive itself. You know, you, you get in the car and you punch in where you want to go and then you like watch movies. That's what I ultimately want. And it doesn't do that yet. But I'm very trusting of technology. So we're in this car. My wife's in the back seat, and we're in the interstate in Chicago. And I have it on autopilot. And this car starts taking an exit. Because, you know, it's using computer vision to look at the lines and stuff like that. It fixed itself. It determined, oh, this, this is no longer my lane. This is an exit thing. So it swerves back in. And it has cameras all over the place looking at cars around you. So we were never in risk of, of uh, like, hitting anything. But it was like you were putting complete trust into the car. So even, like, the, the, the uh, guy from the dealership was, like, nervous. <laughs> no, I didn't even I, I didn't even flinch. I'm here thinking about because you have to keep your hand on the wheel, like have a little pressure. So I'm kind of thinking about like what can I do to like hang something from the wheel with a little weight so I don't actually have to have my hands on the wheel and I can look at stuff. People did that. That was in an article. They just take something to the steering wheel and then that's like all they crash and then they sued uh, Tesla, but obviously they didn't go through. See, I'd be the first one to do that. I, I saw a viral video of someone who put an orange in between the steering wheel, steering wheel and it added enough pressure that he didn't have to take it off on the side of the wall. No, perfect. <laughs> but I want this thing. I mean, so as soon as the uh, they're fully autonomous, because, I mean, Tesla's already had a, a, one of their cars go from uh, Los Angeles to New York, parking lot to parking lot, uh, without human intervention. But, you know, they have, like, an engineer sitting there, like, just waiting for something horrible to happen <laughs> to, 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 to grab the wheel. But it, it did it. So the technology ex exists. Now we got to think about the, the laws. And then we have to think about, you know, the, the real weakness in the system, and that's people. Because now all of a sudden you have autonomous vehicles on the road that are going to use all this computer vision and make instantaneous decisions and things like that. And then you have people. And people are unpredictable. And they go left when they everything says they should have gone right <laughs> and things like that. So it'll be interesting. But as soon as that happens, I'll, I'll, I'll get one of those guys so I can sleep in the car. And that's going to revolutionize travel, won't it? Well, and also it adds uh, other questions. Like what about drunk driving? If you're not actually driving, you just get in your car and you kind of blabber you want to go home. The car takes you home. <laughs> I don't know, kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. There's a moral machine. Whirl machine? Moral? Moral? Uh, it doesn't sound familiar to me. The project done by MIT, it's basically like autonomous driving, where well, the ethics behind is it right for, like, if an autonomous car was in some situation, either run off the road and kill this a driver or kill four other people or something like that. And how would that work out? Because it's like, it's not right to kill it. Either of them, but... Yeah, what's the lesser of multiple evils? Yeah, because it'd be like, well, do you, do you kill the lesser amount of people? Or do you kill the older people that maybe the young, younger people are more beneficial to society kind of thing? And that whole ethics thing is just like... Uh, yeah, I think I'd be in favor more of a coin flip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really what a human would do, right? We're reactionary. So it's, you know, whichever thought pops into our head first and whatever we have time to react to, that's what's going to happen. 
you know, where you see some of these videos with these, uh, you know, there's this, uh, um, I think it was, uh, I think again, it was, there's a lot of Tesla traffic in Chicago. So a lot of the stuff you'll see is in Chicago. It's one of their main test beds. And there was this car and this person's in their Tesla and they think something's wrong with their car because their Tesla starts slowing down the interstate like 15 seconds between before it was like a major, major accident in front of them. So this, so these cars have like, because of their vision, they're able to see stuff way, way before a human being would even notice whether, I mean, it might not have been 15, but it was a big delay way, way ahead of when a human would have seen it. So, you know, at that point it has all sorts of time to figure out what's the right thing to do. And, you know, but, but as a human being, you know, you figure you know, you've got a fraction of a second. So why not just have the computer flip the coin and that it just makes the decision, you know, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. And then, you know, then we can, then we can bring in kind of uh, net neutrality into it where you can actually pay more money so your, your car has a better chance of keeping you alive. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's <not> ethical. <laughs> well, didn't you see that there's a recent video on YouTube with, uh, that explained net neutrality through, uh, with Whoppers. Burger King did this thing where you go into the, uh, we've heard of net neutrality, right? Mm -hmm. But how many of you know what net neutrality is? Okay, what's the concept of net neutrality? Pretty much that um, companies, like big companies, like uh, let's say like YouTube, can pay uh, like internet companies so that they have faster service and like priority. Mm -hmm. Pretty much is a big thing. And then I think then people there's also going to be down the road the line like people may have to pay extra for to the internet companies to use these the increased to get the, the the better service. Right. Yeah, so the Burger King sh uh, commercial showed, like, you know, somebody comes up to the window and orders a Whopper. And you have three different versions of the Whopper. You have, like, the cheap version of the Whopper or the middle-priced or the expensive one. The expensive one, you're a high priority. You're going to get your Whopper quick. The cheap one, you might have a 25-minute wait for your Whopper. You paid way less for a Whopper. Okay, but this other guy comes up. He has Whopper in 30 seconds, but he paid $75 for a Whopper. The person who was paid five bucks for a Whopper, you know, they had a 20 minute wait. That's net neutrality. I mean, it was a really interesting way of kind of explaining it. Which Whopper would you buy? The cheap one? I could pay bucks for it. What if you wanted it fast? It depends how hungry you are. I'm not that hungry. What if it was six hour wait? <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so it kind of becomes an interesting um, thing. But, you know, in any case, you know, the, the, the punchline for us as, as programmers is we do have some limitations on the problems that as human beings we're able to articulate to a computer. And we can only write software for problems that we can solve ourselves, that we can explain how we can solve ourselves, okay, which really creates the, cross, the crossroads there. Is there's a bunch of stuff we can do that we really can't explain how we do it. We can't write programs for those. Now, we might be able to do some machine learning for those and just hope there's an underlying pattern. And it just figures it out, something like that. Um, okay, so last time we started talking about the CPU, and I kind of mentioned the CPU is kind of like this collection of magic tricks. And I uh, connected it to this idea of like a human being. Like, you know, if I sit up here and I, I bend one of my fingers, and I bend my thumb, nobody's impressed that I can do these little tiny things like, oh, good for you. You clap at it, whatever. Okay. Now, but if you put enough of those little tiny movements together, you can do something impressive, right? You know, you can you know throw a baseball, whatever it is. And these are using a whole bunch of individual movements that all flow together into a solution to a real problem. A CPU kind of works the same way, where you know the people at Intel, let's say, that's our most popular uh, CPU company. You know, they've imagined. So there's a, a, a um, uh, an architecture called the uh, x86 architecture and every year when they come out a new processor it's backwards compatible with the previous one they add some new magic tricks to it but you know let's just go back to the kind of their first processor the x86 and they decided you know here's the collection of magic tricks that are these little tiny individual movements and i think this is all we need to solve general purpose problems on the computer that if we do this and then this and then this and then this some real problem got solved Maybe one of those individual magic tricks is not very impressive in and of itself. But you do enough of those guys in sequence, something real happens. Okay? So a CPU is a collection of these magic tricks. 
Um, and that we have to, as a, as a human, we have to somehow be able to tell that CPU to do magic trick one, then magic trick five, then magic trick seven, then magic trick two. So now how do we talk to the CPU? You know, we are not all that great at talking to inanimate objects. Okay. Some of that story will come up later on, but I'm actually somewhat good at it. But um, how many of you uh, have been at the hackathon or something and met Mr. Gonzalez? Oh, the, the psychosis goes deep. Um, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a week two or three story. Uh, we can't, you're not ready for that yet. Um, I have a collection of dolls. So, yeah, you just think it's weird. It gets worse. Well, why? <laughs> you didn't explain it all. You just told us you have dolls. A collection. But why? With backstories. Okay. That have traveled the world. They have names. What time for dolls? All sorts of stuff. Now I've already said too much. <laughs> this is a later thing. Okay, so in any case, we're not very good at talking to inanimate, in, inanimate objects. We can't sit here and scream at our Intel processor, our Core i7, and say, Do magic trick two! Okay. It's not going to work. So how do we ultimately do that? Well, we might say you start off with a programming language. Okay, so, and then the magic is somewhere in between. So if we kind of draw a picture of that, We have our CPU sitting out over here, and then we got our, I think what's the first thing going to look like? Yeah, there's our person right there. No, actually, I can do something really cool here. Um, can I? I think I can. Did I get the thing on here? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's our person, right? <laughs> Do I have a thing for a CPU? Big money, big money. That's the total use of the uh, the the bar thing on the MacBook Pros. You've seen that. That's that's the only thing that's worthwhile for doing with it. It's quick for picking emojis. <laughs> so, all right, so we have what's up? Totally, totally worth it. Um, yeah, the first time I actually learned that it did it, I was typing in tennis or something, and it, a tennis ball popped up on there. So obviously, I have to hit that. Now I just use it for everything, which is really funny because there's a one of our more modern programming languages. I'll give you a little head start here because we're going to talk about it probably next class. Is a language called Swift. And the Swift programming language allows you to name variables with emojis instead of words. And no, it makes no sense to me. That is not the way programming works. Okay, we will have this discussion then. Okay? But you need to have a name for your variable. You can't just like search for like the poop emoji. And, <laughs> like that, that's my variable. That doesn't, that doesn't work. All right. So anyways, we got our person here. We got our computer here. Now, in between, I'm going to spell out programming language so we don't lose track of stuff here. Okay, so we have our programming language. So some, somewhere in here between us and the CPU itself, this programming language needs to tell this guy the magic tricks he needs to do. All right, so now we have to ask, well, how does that actually happen? There are two kinds of programming languages. We have interpreted languages. I don't want to spell languages. It's a tough word to spell. And we have compiled languages. All right, so we go back to this picture here. We'll add some more little squares. So we have compiler okay so depending on the type of programming language we're using our programming language will either fly through a compiler or fly through an interpreter 
Okay, well now what, is, what does that mean? What's a compiler? How many of you have heard of a compiler before? Okay, so a couple of you, kind of the same number of people that said they've done some programming. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's ask the question. What is a compiler? One of those folks who just had a hand up. Or does that fall into the category of things we've heard of that we can't necessarily say what they are? It's a whole lot of technology stuff. Anybody have a definition for a compiler for me? Give it a shot. Okay, well before we can answer that then, there are three kinds of programming languages. We have machine language, we have a low level language, and we have high level languages. All right, so at the end of the day, what language do computers speak? Machine language. Machine language, well, that's, that's the word I have, I have that up there. Yeah, what is that? Ones and zeros. Ones and zeros, so zeros and ones. All right, now, how many of you would feel comfortable going into work every single day with that two-button keyboard? <laughs> Just tapping it out. You would make a mistake within the first 15 seconds. <laughs> okay. People aren't good at that. We don't have that kind of attention span, right? Okay, so that's not for us. But maybe unfortunately for us, that is for computers. Computers operate on digital logic, on or off, zero or one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, some of these new things you might read about quantum computers, there actually is a, is a middle state, a third state, where things might get a little creepier. But for us, let's just leave it at zeros and ones. So that's, that's what, how computers operate. Either electricity is flowing or electricity is not flowing. Okay? So that's not for us. Now, what about a low-level language? A low-level language is a programming language where there is a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. Okay, so we've already talked about the CPU having this, uh, being a collection of magic tricks. So that means I could have a programming language that literally tells the CPU one magic trick at a time what to do. So you write one line of code, it tells CPU to do one magic trick. You write another line of code, it tells the CPU to do another magic trick, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, then you have high-level languages. This is a one to many relationship with the CPU. We write one line of code, it translates into a whole bunch of stuff on the CPU. Power drill, manual screwdriver. Which do we prefer? Power drill, even for the most dainty little, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't use a power drill to screw in those little plastic, uh, um, light switch covers, it's a, the wrong tool for the job. Especially when you go right through the wall and then you ground out on the electrical things and you get blown backwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. noted. What's this? Noted. Yeah, noted. noted. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. telling you what, there was some involuntary hip swinging. <laughs> ha! All right, so. It's <laughs> a, a good one. Uh, it's, it's so good. Um, okay, so looking at some examples of these guys. So a low-level language might be something like assembly language. Some of you may, how many of you have heard of a language called assembly language before? Okay, it exists. Let's look at assembly language real quick. The first program we typically ever, ever write is the Hello World program. All right, so uh, let's do Hello World Linux Assembly. All right, so here's our pro, so I can go to you a little bit bigger, right? There we go. Here's our program right here. All right, so this is 
a low level language. We are telling the CPU each little individual thing that must happen. In fact, actually this gives us an interesting uh, look into uh, how operating systems work. Okay, so this is for the Linux operating system. It just happened to be the one I looked up. All right, so forget about this crap up here. This is like the, the startup stuff. Here's our actual instructions. So we have these things in computers called hardware registers. So uh, your, your, your CPU, your Core i7, Core i5 processor, whatever you have, besides having all these magic tricks, and those magic tricks are implemented in terms of some memory locations. So built into each one of them, they have these little tiny USB sticks, if you will, okay, that can hold just a little bit of information. But they're really, really, really fast, that memory. Okay? So those guys are called like EDX, ECX, EBX, EAX. That's the name of those little hardware memory locations. So think of these guys as four little USB sticks, if you will, for storing some stuff. All right, so the way we work at, at the, um, you know, so now we're kind of dealing with CPUs at the magic trick level. Like we're gonna do this magic trick, then this magic trick, then this magic trick, then this magic trick. So the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say, I'm gonna move some information. That is the, here's my message I'm writing. So down here at the bottom, here's our data section. So I'm having a message, hello world. And then, and that's in a variable called message. And then I have another variable called length, L-E-N. And that guy is equal to the length of the message, number of characters in that guy. So what am I doing here? I am moving into this memory location, the length of hello world. One little magic trick. It's going to take this piece of data, I'm going to put it here. Not impressive. That's the little finger wig, right? <laughs> okay. Then I'm going to take the message itself. I'm going to put it in this other location. That's the, that's the thumb, thumb wiggle. Okay. Then this guy here, this file descriptor, every computer system, every operating system has three different streams. We have a standard input stream, which is typically the keyboard. We have a standard output stream, which is the monitor. And then we also have something called standard error, which is also the monitor, but it's technically two separate streams. That way you can ha happen to put errors in a log file somewhere. Okay, so you can kind of split standard output and standard error if you want to. Unimportant for us right this second. These aren't things for you to memorize. Um, but in any case, what we're gonna load into this memory location is the numeric value for which of our output streams we want to use. So we're going to use standard output, which just happens to be the number one in Linux. Okay, so now I've done the pinky wiggle. Then I'm going to load into EAX. Here's a system call. So the Linux operating system has something called an API. And that API abstract programming interface has a whole bunch of functions that do kind of high level stuff for the operating system. And one of them is called syswrite. Okay. This is the guy that knows how to put crap on the screen. Okay, so now at this point, we're not even doing all the work. We're relying on this other program called syswrite that's built into the Linux operating system to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So keep in mind that this guy right here might be hundreds of lines of code. That isn't even our problem. We're, we're relying on that operating system to do all the hard work for us because we, we're too weak to write it ourselves, right? Because this is bad enough as it is. As we already talked about human beings like power tools, okay? This is not one of those. This is already bad. We don't want to write stuff like this, all right? But in any case, we're gonna, we're gonna put into this memory location um, number four, which just happens to correspond to the syswrite system call on Linux, okay? So this one's probably, I don't know, uh, <laughs> that's that way. <laughs> they were waving. So we've done four little tiny movements and we have no idea what, nothing's happened yet. All we've done is we've put some crap in four different little buckets. Right? You, you, you got to back to your dorm room, put your socks in one drawer, put your underwear in another drawer, yeah, you put, took your hat off, and I don't know, you brushed your teeth. We're still not to class. All right, we haven't actually solved the final problem yet. Then we have this dude right here. It's called an interrupt. So what we've done is we've kind of, we've set the, set the stage. Set the stage, set everything up, ready to go. And then we're telling the CPU, okay, I've done everything I can right now. I now need the operating system to take over. 
So we're going to interrupt the CPU, and this tells the operating system, which the core operating system is called the kernel, to take over. So now Linux jumps into action. And they say, okay, first of all, what am I supposed to do? So the very first thing Linux does is it goes and looks in EAX to find out what, what uh, amazing trick is the programmer asking me to do. It's like, ah, he wants me to do a syswrite. Perfect. I'm only going to need three pieces of information from them. It's gonna, first, I'm going to need a file descriptor. So he's going to go and look right here for that file descriptor. He's going to say, ah, you'd like to write out the sys standard out. Very wise. Very wise. Okay. Then he's going to say, ah, okay, now I need to know what message you'd like to write out. So he's going to look in this memory location to find the message. Then he needs to know how long that message is. Just At this point, it's just a whole bunch of bytes in a row. Well, we'll talk about what bytes are in a little bit, probably next class. But uh, in any case, this guy who's going to look in this memory location for the length of that message. So he has those three pieces of information. This is what I'm going to do in EAX. And then here's the three inputs for what I want to do. And then he does it with his hundreds of lines of code, potentially. We don't know how. It's a magic trick, super magic trick. These are individual magic tricks. This is us telling the CPU what to do. This is the Linux operating system probably writing something even more complex, telling the CPU what to do to actually get stuff showing up on the screen, pixel by pixel by pixel, okay? So now, hello world has appeared on the screen. Great, all right, so we wrote five lines of code. Potentially, this guy turned into another couple hundred lines of code, maybe even more. That's a lot of code, all right? Just to get hello world on the screen. But now, we're done. So our program has to end. So now we need to tell Linux to stop our program from running. So what's the very next thing to do? We Now we're back onto our magic tricks. We move into EAX. Notice it's the exact same memory location that we told it to use syswrite before. Now we move in there a one, which is the system call sysexit. Exit this program. Then what do we do? We interrupt again and tell the operating system to turn, take over. Operating system goes and looks in the very same first place as it looked before. Before it looked in EAX and found a four, which told him he needed to do three, look three, get three additional pieces of information. Now he looks in EAX and finds a one and says, oh, I don't need anything else. I'm just supposed to end this program. Done. That's hello world. Trivial, right? Go ahead. Is there a way of yeah, if you look at the, do a search for the Linux Linux kernel, look at the implementation for syswrite. Probably syswrite.c is probably the name of the thing. So at that point, it becomes even worse because now what you're looking at is you're looking at a high-level language written in C. And that guy's going to compile down to the low-level language of assembly. So the high-level language is probably going to be maybe 50, 60, 70 lines of code, which is going to translate into probably several hundred lines of code in assembly. So you would have to look at the compiled version of that uh, the assembly language version of syswrite. So if you do a search for assembly language, syswrite Linux, you might be able to see the individual instructions. All right. So all of that work just to get hello world to spit on the screen. If that's what your career was going to be moving forward, how many of you would drop the class today? Well, it's kind of a requirement and I've already switched majors twice. <laughs> it's kind of locked in. All right. Now, this feels cool for about five minutes. How many of you have ever used Linux, the Linux operating system? Okay. Two and a quarter? Okay. How, do you still use it? How many of you are Windows users? Most of you. How many of you are Mac users? Some of you, right? Now, why? Why Windows and Mac versus Linux? Go ahead. You might even be, make, be able to make an argument that's more reliable because it's open source. There's more people fixing bugs. Yeah. But, but definitely not as popular. Yeah. Go ahead. It's more user friendly. Windows. Yeah, that's Windows and Mac are probably more user friendly. Mm -hmm. Right? 
So, you know, Linux would kind of be like driving a car where, you know, you have all these different strings, you know, to, to get different things to work, right? You know, like different valves to open and close and stuff of like that because, you know, really, you know, Linux, you feel like you're really using your operating system because, you know, you're... You're very much the the train engineer, okay? You know, Linux has become more user-friendly over the years, especially if you're using a distribution like Ubuntu or something like that. But any way you cut it, you know, Mac OS or Windows is going to be a, a nicer user experience. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at Linux, look into Linux as a as a uh, uh, IT person uh, or you know a techie techie person, especially in IT, because you'll be using Unix and Linux and stuff like that quite a bit. Um, but certainly. The right tool for the job is the easier tool for the job. Linux is more the educational thing, right? Um, so in any case, if we were writing the same program for Windows assembly or Mac assembly, it would look pretty similar. You know, little twists and turns, but you know, the Windows system calls might be named a little bit different. They might have a little bit different number associated with them. They might look for their the things in a little bit different place, but it's going to be pretty similar to the same stuff. All right, now the punchline for us is we are not necessarily fans of this type of thing as humans. This would become very tedious for us uh, if we had to do it day in, day out. That's not, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a place, but it would become very tedious. So getting back here, after we said there's three kinds of programming languages, we have the machine language, zeros and ones, definitely not for us. We have a low level language like assembly like we just looked at, that's in our wheelhouse, but not probably the thing we want. A high-level language like Java, for example, or uh, Python. Hello world is just print. Hello world. Done. One line of code. Back. Right? That's the type of thing a person likes. So I'll... What's a compiler then? This goes back to the previous slide. There's two kinds of programming languages, interpreted and compiled. A compiler translates a high-level language into a low-level language. Okay. At the end of the day, we need to feed the CPU zeros and ones. One way or another, we got to get our high-level code, our power tool, down to that point. Now, we've already decided that as lazy people, we're going to use high-level languages. We like power tools. <laughs> okay? So we're going to need a tool, like a compiler, to turn that guy into instructions. Low-level instructions for that CPU. Those low-level instructions then turn into zeros and ones. Make sense? All right, so we'll pick up here next time. We're gonna talk about when would we ever write, I mean, just as a reminder for myself, I'm just gonna write that slide real quick. When might we use assembly today? All right, we'll talk about that next time. Our gamer people should pay attention to that. All right, I will see everybody on Friday. Remember, your uh, Bible homework is already up there, so make sure you read that verse. Give me a paragraph or two. Uh, submit it. You do not have to submit a self-evaluation with the, uh, the, uh, the Bible homework. All right, that's more of the programming stuff, but write me a paragraph or two. All right, I'll see everybody on Friday.